Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to IET London Savoy Place. There are no scheduled fire alarms for this evening. If you hear the alarm, please go through your nearest fire exit and make your way to the meeting point under Waterloo Bridge. Staff will be on hand to lead the way. Tonight's Eng Talk will begin shortly, so please take your seats and ensure your mobiles are turned to silent. Thank you. The Appleton Lecture was established in 1965 to commemorate the life and work of Sir Edward Appleton, a widely honoured physicist and Nobel Prize winner noted for his research into the upper atmosphere. In 1924, he was able to demonstrate the existence of the electrified reflecting layer in the upper atmosphere. The existence of this layer had been suggested by Kennelly and Heaviside in 1902. Appleton demonstrated the existence of a second layer, now referred to as the Appleton layer. His work into pure and applied physics and his research into the characteristics of the ionosphere received international recognition in 1947, winning the Nobel Prize for Physics. He also received the IEE Faraday Medal in 1952. Last year, our prestige lecture series became the IET Eng Talk series, and tonight is the first Eng Talk inspired by the life and work of Edward Appleton. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely excited to introduce our host for this evening, Yuandi Akinola. Your presenter for tonight is a chartered design engineer working on projects in the UK, Africa, Middle East and East Asia. Her professional specialities are water, design for manufacture and assembly, project engineering and innovation management. She has won several awards, including the IET's Young Woman Engineer of the Year and the UK Outstanding Woman in STEM. Alongside her work, she has presented engineering programs for television and has featured on Channel 4, Discovery Channel, Yesterday TV and CBBS. She is very passionate about STEM and gives talks in schools, working to inspire young people to consider STEM careers. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to Savoy Place this lovely evening. Um, just in case you didn't hear the fire procedures, if the alarm goes, it will be for real. Um, if the alarm goes, uh, please just, you know, the exits, go through the exits, um, meet under uh, Waterloo Bridge, which is kind of in that direction. Um, and, Hopefully, we shouldn't be expecting anything to happen this fine evening. Um, tonight's speakers are uh, Dr. Sarah Atkinson and Dr. Howley. Uh, there'd be time for questions immediately um, after both uh, the speakers have uh, given their presentations and their talks. Dr. Sarah Atkinson is head of Department uh, of Culture, Media and Creative Industries at King's College London and co-editor of Convergence, the international journal of research into new media technologies. Sarah has published widely on the impacts of digital technologies on film and cinema audiences and film production practices. Sarah has undertaken extensive work into live cinema economy and is currently working on a number of immersive media projects, including a virtual reality diversity initiative, a project which explores artificial intelligence and conversational interactivity in games and XR circus, which brings together circus artist with immersive technologies. It is with great pleasure I welcome to the stage this evening, Dr. Sarah Atkinson.
an absolute pleasure to be here, an honour, so thank you for inviting me. And I'm here this evening to talk about what fairies and aliens can teach us about deep fakes. So I just wondered if you could just give me a show of hands. Do you all know what deep fakes are in the audience this evening? Maybe just raise your hand if you do. Okay, so not that many I can see in relation. So a very quick uh, a layman's definition of what a deep fake is. It's a video which basically shows someone who isn't actually there doing something or saying something they wouldn't have normally been doing through artificial intelligent deep learning techniques. So it's through mapping the facial um, movements of another and then implanting through learning techniques the face. So face swapping is actually the common term that's been used for that. So yeah, there's a uh, very obviously serious implications around that, which we'll come to. Um, there's been lots of fears and reporting in the media about this. What was once something that took lots of specialists, high-tech technology, processing power, etc., is now being put in the hands of the public. It's publicly accessible on standard computers. It doesn't take much to create one of these deep fake videos. So fears in the media that we've seen recently, the Washington Press earlier this month, their headline was, fake news is about to get so much more dangerous. US lawmakers in a recent publication said deep fakes have the potential to disrupt every facet of society and they are a threat to national security. So how are we best going to make sense of them? I think the, the way to find out about what might happen in the future is to look back at history. So we'll do that now by looking at a point of introduction or popularization of a technology. So from photography to the World Wide Web to some famous examples to some more obscure so join me in taking a trip back through time to look at these. So firstly, this image here. So do we recognize this? This is a short film made by the Lumiere brothers, The Arrival of a Train at La Ciotat. The Lumiere brothers, as many of you I'm sure will know, were the inventors of the cinematograph. So this was a device that enabled multiple people to watch a piece of moving image for the first time. They used to be just through singular devices, so that's really quite, quite crucial. So what was reported at the time of the screening of this film in 1895 in Paris was when the train came towards the screen, it was just a static image, um, the camera was static, the train came thundering towards the screen, allegedly the audience members got up, ran away screaming because they thought it was real. And that was reported in papers, and it's kind of a myth that actually still persists today, perpetuated by the media. So if we move on to our next example, skip a bit further through time to 1917. This image is of the Cottingley Fairies, which you may have seen. So this was at the advent of consumer technology, consumer photography, sorry. Two young girls, aged 16 and 9, took these photos, and they were believed to be real for over six decades. They only admitted to their fakery in the 1980s, and indeed Arthur Conan Doyle wrote in 1920 that this was visible evidence of psychic phenomena. So again, believed to be real and perpetuated by the media, but at the point at which technology became possible for, for everyday people. Move forward again to 1938, we see the War of the Worlds radio broadcast. So this was H.G. Wells' fiction, um, dramatised by Orson Welles and his theatre company. It was a radio broadcast that went out on the 31st of October, but allegedly there was reports of thousands of Americans fleeing their homes as they believed to be being invaded by Martians. So what was happening through this broadcast, they dramatised as it happens news broadcasting. So there was a the sound of an orchestra playing through the radio, people tuned in and then it was interrupted by an emergency broadcast and people kind of recognised this technique because of the Hindenburg crash which had happened a year previously in uh, 1937. So again, they believed it to be real and the media reported on the panic that, that happened as a result. Forward into television now, big jump into 1995. This is a lesser known example, it's Forgotten Silver, a documentary that was on New Zealand public service television made by Peter Jackson in 1995. And what he did was rewrite the history of filmmaking um, by creating this fictional character, Colin McKenzie, but as if it was real. So using emulation of documentary and archival footage so that people who tuned in because it was public service broadcasting, trusted this to be real and believed that the whole cinema, cinema history um, was created by Colin McKenzie. There were no actors in the credits when this went out and they received lots of complaints about this being a hoax. And again, the newspaper wrote um, a lot about this. So now we're 
coming more to the present day, 1999, the Blair Witch Project. So this was at the advent of the World Wide Web, again, a new technology that was coming into the hands of the public. And again, there were reports and research projects, actually, that, that showed that people believed this to be real. Not the film itself, but the preceding marketing campaign, which took place over, over websites and through a fake documentary called The Curse of the Blair Witch. Again, people thought this was real in the, in the lead up to the film. And the newspapers and the media fueled it by reporting on this. So the indie filmmakers who were making this film generated a huge marketing furore around the film with very little kind of capital investment associated normally with Hollywood film. And then the final example that we'll look at is the truth about Marika, perhaps one that you don't know about, but again, another project. This was in 2007, broadcast on the Swedish Public Service Network, and it was based on the missing person tale of a, of a person called Marika. But because it went out on a public news broadcasting service, people tuned in, believed that Marika was a real missing person, and went on the associated website to kind of, you know, help with the sightings of her, and then were very angered when they realised that it wasn't real, that it was fake. So we're now kind of into our present day with deep fakes. Um, when we look back at these, it kind of beggars belief with, with hindsight that people actually believe that these things happen, um, but, but they all did. And so in all watershed moments that these are in the history of media, we see the same recurring things happen. There's a pattern, it's cyclical. So all of these examples were fictional content based in a factual context, in a trusted factual context that up until that point, people trusted to believe to be true and real. And they used the media techniques of the time, so people were kind of versed in those. And what they came hand in hand in was these media accounts that kind of exaggerated and brought it into the public conscience. So they're all moments where technolo technology became popularized, it became accessible for audiences to use. So I'd argue perhaps deep fakes is where we are on that continuum. And this is the new point at which we're becoming acclimatised, educated, made aware that this is now possible, that things can be faked to such a point that we don't know the distinction between fact and fiction. And obviously that comes with huge ethical implications. But again, if we look at, look at how deep fakes began and what the first use of it was, was face swapping. Um, in face swapping was pornography. So what they did, what the people did who were using this technology was to put the faces of famous female celebrities onto porn stars to make it look like they were there. But if we again look at back at the cycle of technological advancement, we can see that pornography always leads the way in technological adoption, advancement and domestication. So there's nothing new there. Again, it's a pattern that always happens, so there's no surprise. Um, what we're also seeing is the kind of the worry in the news headlines that we've seen are the fact that deep fakes could be used to circumvent and subvert political communication. In fact, one of the first videos that was used by researchers in Washington was using the face of Barack Obama and mapping a speech that he'd made years earlier. So there's the worry now that political communication will be faked to the point we don't know what's real and, and what's fake. And obviously it's quite an easy one to do when you look at the technologies that, that Howe shows in his talk in a moment because politicians are just standing in a static position, it's quite easy to kind of map the face and the speech of one onto another. So we look at the scare stories and the headlines, and what we can see with these advancements already is counter technologies being developed. So this one here shows deep fake detection through eye blinking. So they're, very, they're not quite there yet in terms of how real they look, and this is one way of telling whether the, the video you're watching is a deep fake through how many times the person blinks their eyes. There's also anti-face swap porn policies on all platforms, so Reddit initiated that. So there's already an awareness building in the media that accompanies these these new scares. So now we're at a point where we're not quite there yet, but what there is is this generation of fear around deception, fraudulent activity and ill-doing. And we don't know where it will go, but what we can see is there are lots of possibilities. And certainly deep fakes will definitely take their place as a historical marker of this moment where media is entering its artificially intelligent phase. So it could be exciting times as well as daunting, Audience members are no longer a passive inert force, as we know. And as history has always shown us, when you put the technology in the hands of the audience, interesting, innovative, and unexpected things can happen in ways that we have yet to imagine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Wow, that was... Um fascinating. Fakes, deep fakes, I didn't know those existed. Um, 
Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Um, it's with great pleasure I um, welcome Dr. Hao Li to the stage. Um, Dr. Hao Li is the director of Vision and Graphics Lab at the Institute for Creative Technologies at the University of uh, Southern California. Hao describes himself as a German-born punky of Taiwanese descent doing computer graphics. Um, he's best known for his work on dynamic geometry processing and data-driven techniques for making 3D human uh, digitization and facial animation accessible to the masses. He worked on the famed digital reenactment of Paul Walker in the movie Fast and Furious 7, and his research has led to the facial animation technology in Apple's iPhone X. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Howley. Oh my God, uh, great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Um, so, um, the uh, business we're in at is about how to create virtual humans so that we can distinguish them from uh, reality, right? So I'm a computer graphics uh, scientist and also work uh, at this intersection between uh, graphics and computer vision. And one of the goals that we have is really about how can we um, create an illusion for an audience, right? How can we um, create something that uh, people would believe in and the first thing that you think about that is, you know, how can we uh, create computer animations? How can we create VFX that look absolutely real, right? And we use computer simulations um, and renderings in order to achieve these type of effects. And one of the new things that comes into play is perhaps we can even enable something like uh, the metaverse, right? Perhaps we can use immersive technologies like virtual reality so that anyone can basically relive any moment in life, can teleport themselves into arbitrary environments, et cetera. One of the nightmare scenarios is that, you know, I'm pretty sure uh, you're familiar with your cell phones, is that hopefully we're not end up uh, someday in like uh, this kind of uh, <clears throat> scene here. So one of the focuses that we have is trying to think a little bit about what are the research directions we're going in. I'm going to show you a couple of research areas that we're working on um, in our three entities, right? The Vision and Graphics Lab at ICT, as well as USC, uh, my, my, my lab at USC, and the startup at Pinscreen. And um, social interaction is uh, one of the key things that we're trying to solve, right? The idea is really um, twofold. We want to create um, a technology that allows us to scale content creation. Content, any interactive 3D content creation nowadays, you need a game studio, you need a VFX company to achieve these goals, which is you know, involving a team of engineers and you know, digital artists and months and months of work in order to create all these amazing um, 3D images. Uh, but the, the, the idea here is, can we allow end users or ordinary general audience to create these type of content? The second thing is about communication. If we have the tools to create uh, 3D content, can we create a new form of immersive communication where we can actually talk to each other as if we were actually physically present? So it's all about telepresence. And we're not the only people looking into uh, these kind of technologies. Here's an example where um, you know, Oculus is also trying to look into what is the future or the next generation platform of social media when people can actually interact as 3D avatars. But that's not the idea of like how we're going to look into. This is sort of like in-progress work. And one thing that we're going to look at later is how we can create a photoreal appearance of ourselves uh, similar to what we see in science fiction movies. The first thing is whenever you think about you know, using VR to um, have a form of communication, uh, the first problem is you know, half of your face is occluded. right? So you have this huge uh, bulky um, display on your face. So you're not going to capture uh, what the person is actually doing. So in collaboration with uh, Oculus, we actually developed um, a couple of years ago the uh, first system that allows people to um, be immersed inside VR and also uh, be able to track their own facial performances in real time uh, using various sensors. So here's an example of the first system we built. 
Um, this is one of my students, Kyle, who is actually using the VR headset. And you can see that his face is being tracked in real time and reproduced inside a VR system. Of course, this is not a very um, appealing system to wear, especially with this mount in front of your face. So uh, what we came up um, uh, a year later is another system that, is a little, that has a slightly better form factor and is purely based on you know, um, RGB sensing and RS sensing uh, inside the eye area. So let me show you one of the first work where we use deep learning actually to um, map the facial expressions onto a digital avatar. It's still very cartoony, but it gives you an idea of how people would communicate using these type of immersive systems. Pretty soon we'll all be living in a science fiction movie but hopefully not one of the scary ones. What do you mean that you can't make it? That wasn't part of the pl Right, so, and here's a live performance um, of the person wearing the VR headset. Like that? Yeah. See something? Wow, Mars is so much more red than I imagined. So this is interesting because um, this is a technology that we published um, back in 2016, and only a couple of years later, uh, you can see where Oculus is at, right? So that's something that he presented this year at a conference called SIGGRAPH. And one thing that they're building is really a photoreal reenactment of the person, right? So that people can have the sense of um, telepresence uh, in real time. So one of the issues is that you can, you know, first of all, you can already see that people get an idea of how telecommunication could be if we had photoreal digital characters. Um, but then the problem is that this is something that is still very difficult to be accessible for end users because for each subject, you need um, a ton of cameras. So we, they basically use 40 cameras, an array of 40 cameras to record different angles of the person in real time. It's in some ways, interpolating uh, to the right angle in order to render uh, the view of the subject, right? So it's not something that you can easily allow consumers to use. What's available to consumers so far is still uh, something that looks like this, right? So you have a database of avatars, you can pick the one that you want and automatically customize it. So one of the research directions we're working on is how can we automate um, this entire process of creating something that is photoreal. So the first thing we need to do is understand how do we create digital humans in general, right? So um, a couple of years ago, I was invited to um, a company called Weta Digital. So they're famous for a lot of the rings, avatar, and all these VFX project, uh, VFX uh, visual effects. And um, one of the projects uh, I was super happy to work on was uh, Fear 7, right? So uh, Paul Walker unfortunately died in a car accident, and uh, in this movie, what they were trying to do is basically reenact his face as close as possible to reality. So one thing that you may or may not know is that his entire face is actually CG, and the actor that was playing him was actually his brother. So let me show you a quick sequence of how this was made. Right. So you can see that uh, this is his brother, and. Um, they actually worked on you know, building a CG character of his face, and we were actually working on you know, techniques that would actually track his face and also render the face um, in a way that uh, we can create a digital replica of uh, Paul Walker for the final movie. So one of the issues for these type of VFX pipelines is that you need months of work just to create a couple of seconds of animation. So it's not something that would be even close to accessible to people, but, um, you can achieve a quite photorealistic output from this. If you look at what is possible nowadays, uh, this is a work from between Epic Games, Cubic Motion, and Three Lateral, is a state-of-the-art uh, system that allows people to drive virtual characters in real time. So you can still see that uh, the character still lands a little bit in this uncanny valley, so you can tell that it's a synthetic human. But um, this avatar can be driven in real time, so the animation problem is... Um, you know, largely improved. Um, the only issue here is that creating such an asset also requires weeks, if not months of work in order to generate one of these avatars. So what is the research component here? The research component is about, can we automate this process? And second, can we create it, if not in seconds or in real time? And what does it mean also in terms of implications, impact, uh, outside, beyond uh, the field of, you know, entertainment, 
computer graphics, etc. So here's sort of like the pitch. If you look at um, the first three rows, right, we, ha we have different ways of creating computer graphics content. The traditional graphics content pipeline uh, works as follows, right? So you basically have asset creation, you have animators that animate uh, the 3D assets, and then you have a rendering pipeline. So everything consists of um, you know, computer graphics models that approximate how reality works, and in some way, um, everything is a hack on how reality looks like. And what researchers and artists do is that they tweak parameters so that the final output looks as real as possible. So one thing that we can see is that with the VFX pipeline, we can get to photoreal content, but creating the assets are extremely slow and difficult. If you look at the game uh, pipeline, you can create real-time content, such as those in uh, video games, but then the issue is that you still lack a little bit of this photorealism, which is extremely difficult to achieve uh, when you want to recreate digital humans. Now, the pitch here is that if you use a technique um, such as deep learning, right, so one of the fields in artificial intelligence, where all the uh, processing is driven solely by massive amounts of data, you can in some ways shortcut the problem of um, you know, generating digital content in a way that it always looks real. So you can ensure that it looks real, but then one of the other challenges is how do we have control over this type of data. So the first thing when you hear about deep learning, um, it's mostly for computer vision problems. How can I detect an object and you have this deep neural network that would basically as input, take an input image and then parse and then say, this is a dog that I'm looking at. Now, if you can invert that um, deep neural network, you can actually use it to generate content. And this is, in some ways, the purpose of computer graphics. So let me show you a couple of examples on the research areas that we're working on where we can actually use deep neural networks to change how uh, computer graphics um, uh, can't, is capable of, right? So let's look at photoreal faces, right? Faces are one of the hardest things to create a digital model of because we're super sensitive to if something looks real or is synthetic, right? If there's something off, we can tell that it's a you know, fake CG face. So the traditional approach here is to use very sophisticated capture uh, techniques such as um, the light stage capture device developed by Dr. Paul DeBevick at USC ICT. And we're using these measurement devices to measure high fidelity geometries, complex reflectance properties. But once you have collected this data, one of the potential things you can do is actually develop techniques that can actually automate or infer, predict uh, this type of content without requiring this massive amount of capture device. So here's an old work uh, from 20 years ago um, from um, Blenz and Feta. And what they did here was, given a single input image, can we generate a compelling face model? So they could actually generate pretty um, you know, compelling face models, but they could never look real and they could never be used for applications such as VFX because the fidelity was just not high enough. And then the second thing is you can never generate assets that are relatable in new environments in a very um, compelling way. So the question is how do we, how can we reach photorealism if we only have a single input image? This is basically one of the data that is necessary for consumers to be accessible. So here's one way, right? So there is a seminal work uh, from uh, a gentleman called Ian Goodfellow uh, on generative adversarial networks. It's a very special type of deep generative model that allows you to generate photoreal content, um, you know, given random numbers, given a feature vector, or given a low resolution input image. And um, one of the things that NVIDIA has done using generative adversarial networks is we have um, created photorealist, like high resolution photoreal faces that are purely synthetically generated. So the example I'm showing here is really interesting because these faces actually don't exist. It was purely generated by, in some ways, by an artificial intelligence, right? And one of the issues you can see here is that when you look at very carefully, you can still see some weird artifacts uh, in the faces, and these become very apparent when you try to interpolate between the space of human faces, right? So, this is when you try to morph between uh, different faces that are completely generated. 
and you can see some you know, weird artifacts uh, around faces. So the problem with deep neural networks is that they can generate photoreal content, but then one of the issues is how do you really control them? And control is one of the key things that are important in a field of computer graphics because we want to generate content. So one thing that we developed uh, back then, uh, that was just like um, um, a year ago, is um, a technique that would, instead of just purely synthesizing photoreal faces, it would actually transfer photoreal details from an existing database onto a, uh, onto a face. And this work has been inspired by one of the seminal works from Leon Gattis, uh, who now works at Apple. And uh, I'm pretty sure some of you have actually seen this work. The idea is basically you have, you take a photograph and you can actually create a, foot, a um, stylized painting, right, in the style of Van Gogh, for example, and you would basically transfer the style onto this input picture. Now, what we thought about was, why don't we just use the same technique and transfer photoreal faces onto another picture of a photoreal face so that we can generate photoreal facial content? And the challenge here was, you could, but then how do you preserve the likeness of the person? Because Again, one of the issues here is how do you achieve control? So in this work, uh, what we did was we thought about using um, you know, a personality that is not with us anymore, so in this case, Muhammad Ali, and we can't have a photoreal scan of him or a high-resolution scan. So the only thing we could do is actually use an you know, algorithm that would actually generate a high-resolution uh, face model of himself. So the idea here was to use a high resolution a database with high resolution images, and what we would do is not pick one specific uh, subject and transfer his details onto uh, Muhammad Ali, but what we do is basically blend between different subjects in a very specific way so that we can actually reproduce uh, the likeness of Muhammad Ali, but also hallucinate photorealistic details on a 3D uh, model of him. Right? So we did this fun test where we took a young, pic, a young picture of uh, Trump and, um, so that we can do fun things with him later on. And um, <clears throat> basically what this pipeline does is that it samples from his face what is unique about his face, what are the most likely high dimensional features about you know, his pores and structures and colors of his face and then sample from this database and then try to reproduce something that could look like him when we zoom in, when we zoom in very close to him. So here are a couple of results of what we could generate. So you can see that on the left, what we did was we purposely took low resolution input images and what this deep neural network can do is generate high resolution photoreal pores of the person if you zoom in close enough, right? Um, this, unfortunately, cannot be used directly in movies because, you know, all the details, all the shadings are sort of like baked into the textures. But what we've shown recently is that we can even separate highly complex reflectance properties if we had the right training data that is obtained from a device such as the light stage. So this is something that we just presented a couple of months ago um, in Vancouver. Um, <clears throat> basically a method where all you need is actually an iPhone uh, picture and what it does is that it generates high resolution 3D assets of the face of the subject as well as textures, reflectance properties, um, you know, specularities of the face, etc. And one of the great advantage here is that we can reilluminate this CG face into any arbitrary environment. So um, this is to give you an idea of uh, what kind of resolution we can get from just the single. Uh, picture. So when you zoom in a lot, a lot of the details are basically hallucinated. And uh, they're not real, but they look plausible, right? So these are all static images, and they contribute to building a virtual avatar of a person. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is how do we create or how do we generate the dynamics of the face. So facial performance, or in general, human performance capture, is something that is you know, widely used in the industry. For example, if we want to do motion capture, I'm pretty sure you've seen some making ofs of PFX movies where you have actors where they put like these dots on their bodies or cameras that attach to their heads. And the idea here is really how can we make um, facial animation more realistic? How can we save the time from 
animators in creating these things by using an actor and by basically tracking what their faces and human bodies are doing and transfer those onto the CG character. So this is a pipeline, for example, that they were using uh, at Industrial Light and Magic. And back in the days when I started my PhD, we thought about a couple of things, right? We were like, well, do people really have to wear these cameras? Um, do they have to you know, have all these markers on their face? Can we get rid of these things? And back then, um, way before you know, Microsoft's Kinect came out, uh, there were a lot of research scientists uh, who were building um, techniques that allows you to actually capture sense 3D instead of just an RGB video. And these are basically real-time depth sensors that capture actually a 3D um, scene in real time, right? And one thing that we did was we tried to use geometry processing to process the raw input data and see if we can actually track faces in real time, right? And later on, uh, when I joined Industrial Light and Magic and worked there for a year, we developed a system that does not require high-end um, capture devices, right? So we used a commercial um, depth sensor that is only $100. And what we could do is actually get pretty convincing facial animations um, just using the single camera without using anything um, that requires you know, complex processing. And everything was uh, happening in real time. So here's a sequence, right? So this is my uh, friend Mike Jutan uh, from ILM. So we were tracking his face. You can see the raw data on the left of it. And in the middle, that was his track face. And we can basically retarget you know, arbitrary characters uh, from that. So that was sort of like the vision of how we could make, you know, virtual production scalable and more low cost and directors can have a, you know, um, a preview of how um, their characters would look like uh, in the end. Um, more recently, we further developed this technique so that it does not require, you know, depth sensors anymore and also have extremely accurate tracking. So we can basically get rid of all these points and track almost everything uh, all the facial expressions on the subject, right? Still, even if you can track all the points on the face perfectly, it's very, very difficult to transfer these expressions onto another subject because this other subject may have different facial expressions. Um, if I'm trying to transfer my <coughs> the shape of my face onto someone with a smaller or bigger head, all the proportions would be wrong and you can tell Again, there's, there's something synthetic about this face. So that's why in VFX, most of the times, you have artists that would actually refine the animations that are captured using these type of motion capture technologies. So one of the techniques uh, that we have developed uh, very recently and also um, demonstrated uh, for the first time at SIGGRAPH uh, this summer is a deep uh, learning-based approach that basically synthesizes uh, based on the tracking of a person's face, it synthesizes the image directly. So it's synthesizing the texture and also the facial expressions at very high resolution. So let me show you an example of how this works. Um, on the left, you have a single picture of a person, and this is the target that I want to achieve. In the middle, you have the driver, so I'm tracking his face and trying to understand what kind of expression he's doing. And on the right, you have the output uh, result. So let me play this. So you can basically see that in real time it can generate the face of the person. It's not transferring, you know, samples of uh, the person in the middle. It's really generating it. And the way it works is that we train a deep neural network with massive amounts of, you know, people's faces in different expressions, in different lighting conditions, in different angles. And what it does is that it learns that based on the expression that the person in the middle is doing, it can actually generate the face of the other person. It's purely imagined, has never seen anything else from this uh, person. And one thing that we, are, we have developed and will come out soon as part of Pinscreen is basically an app that allows you to create photoreal avatars from just a single picture. So this involves uh, an additional uh, compression algorithm that would allow it to run uh, on the phone. So I'm happy to show you this um, offline. I have it actually on my phone. So you can actually drive a photoreal character that looks, you know, in certain ways superior than what you have in most of the games. So 
And this person, you know, you can insert it into any game engine. Uh, you can relight it. And we believe that if we further push this advancement, this is uh, one way to allow us to, you know, socialize or communicate in a virtual environment. One thing that's extremely powerful about this technique is that it's not only about facial expressions. It can also generate new views of the person without having ever seen it. So let me show this on the uh, next slide. So you can see on the upper right, uh, you have input images of people we have never seen before. We've only seen their front face. And based on his face, we can actually generate uh, what kind of facial expressions they would have and uh, how they would look like from different angles. Right? So he's going to turn his head a little bit to the left, to the right, right? and it generates these input images. So this is uh, very unconventional because it's not how the traditional computer graphics pipeline works. It's something that is purely driven uh, by data. And it works extremely well on a wide range of subjects um, whether it's like female, male, you know, different ethnicities, different ages, and also, you know, with different facial hair properties. So, you know, one of our main um, motivations here is really to improve content creation uh, for the creatives. But, of course, as uh, Sarah mentioned before, uh, this also has very deep implications in terms of, like, if it's uh, been used or accessible to uh, the wrong hands, uh, simply because this technology allows anyone to create these type of data. You only need a single picture, right? And deepfakes, of course, um, compared to deepfakes, this uh, technology that we're advancing is um, even more superior because you just need a single picture. And who knows uh, what kind of effects we'll have in a couple of months. So the technology here is really increasing exponentially. Uh, especially with all these advances that are happening in machine learning. Um, this is a fun um, demo that we have done with, but, uh, with, in, uh, to, together with BuzzFeed and Netflix. And the idea is really what can we generate from a single picture and really to create awareness. So let me play this next video. My fellow Americans, this is not President Trump. This is Charlie Warzel from BuzzFeed News. And the future... I can assure you, is extremely terrifying. Right, and um, this can be this can be driven in real time. So I was messing around, you know, I couldn't get like I didn't want to cut my hair, so um, I just messed it a little bit around, and I put Putin's face on my face, and it was really just a random picture that you know we downloaded from the internet, um, and we just put it uh, on my face, right? So you can show I'm actually filming it. Uh, and it's all happening in real time. <clears throat> now there's people who you know, wonder, like, how close is it? How real is it? Um, the next example is uh, uh, an experiment with it with our friend Mike Seymour. Um, on the left, you'll basically see a real video sequence of Mike. And what we did on the right is basically we created a, uh, it's the same video, but the face area is actually CG. And it gives you an idea of how close we are. So you can still tell there are a couple of weird artifacts, but uh, we're getting very, very close. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so here I am actually in uh, the offices of uh, Pinscreen getting my face scanned, or rather actually just photographed on an iPhone, which uh, you know, is great, don't get me wrong, I'm just used to bigger cameras uh, with more tech, not just one being held in someone's hand uh, with a Mickey Mouse back on it. Right. Okay. So you can easily imagine you just add a little bit of compression uh, to the videos and uh, probably uh, all the artifacts are non-visible uh, to humans. Right, so now we have avatars, they can move, and then the next thing is about hair, right? So we're also working a lot on hair. Um, and hair is notoriously difficult uh, for you know, computer graphics. Um, usually you have artists who would actually design all the hair. You have to go through a very um, complex process of simulating how hair actually move and interacts with each other. And afterwards, you know, it has a volumetric structure and even the rendering is something that's very difficult. So we're looking at, um, you know, how do we develop new data-driven algorithms that could actually allow people to create full hair automatically because in the end, we're interested in creating virtual humans. Right, so this is a work that we've done a couple of years ago um, that is based, it's a data-driven algorithm, not using um, you know, deep learning. Um, basically, you have a large database of hair, but given an input image, it would basically select the closest hair model and then 
deform it to fit the input image, and you can get quite convincing results, right? And if you add the right priors, you can also get, um, you know, handle very, very complex uh, hair types such as braids. Uh, but one of the issues here is robustness, right? It's not something that always works. Uh, you can easily find a situation where you have a strong specular light on the hair and the al entire algorithm would break. So one thing that we're looking uh, into recently is a purely deep learning based approach that actually allows you to give an input image and generate the 3D model uh, directly, right? So this is a so-called variational autoencoder and we converted this thing to make it work that it can process 3D hair models. So here are a couple of examples, right? So you can see that it can generate, you know, it's not um, production ready yet, but it's something that shows the potential of it. You have an input image and it can generate highly complex hair models. It can handle extremely complex ones, right? So you have this punk hair hairstyle and it knows um, that this is the type of hair model that it should generate. It does not involve a database anymore. It really is just an imp input image and then from this input image, it infers the high dimensional feature vector and from the feature vector, it can generate the 3D content. What's amazing is you can input a Bitmoji input image and it knows that this is the most plausible hair model that belongs to it. Or it doesn't even have to be human. You can even put this uh, <laughs> dog in here and uh, it knows that these hair are the structures we're looking at. Uh, one thing that's very, very um, interesting from a, a research standpoint is that you know, a lot of people ask, well, in your previous algorithm, you use like so many hundreds you know, hair models. It's very tedious to build this database. How many hair models do we have now? Well, in some ways, we have infinite numbers because between arbitrary hairstyles, we can actually interpolate them you know, seamlessly. So we basically learn a continuous space that represents what hair is, right? Um, I mean, hair is an interesting example um, for virtual avatars, but that's probably the only use case. Um, I think it can be used for any kind of uh, objects like clothing, et cetera, right? Another thing that we've been looking at is hair rendering, right? So when you have the 3D model, how do you put it on the screen? Normally, it's a very tedious process where you need to, you know, light from the right direction. You need to set up the material properties, et cetera. And again, we're using deep neural networks to replace this entire process. And um, this is a unsupervised technique. Uh, we basically have a machine with three high-end GPUs uh, put together. And what it does is that it takes a 3D hair model, renders it using a traditional approach, and then goes through intermediate representation so that in the end, it generates a photorealistic um, hair, right? So these are um, <clears throat> some early results, right? So something we just published at uh, ECCV uh, a week ago. So you can see that this is a hair model um, that is either digitized or created by an artist. And what we wanna do is we wanna know what kind of color it has. So instead of, um, instead of uh, going through a computer simulated model of how light interacts with material, because this is too complex, we just train it with massive amounts of data and say, well, it should look like a picture. Right? And um, what he does here is, this is already generating in real time how the hair would look like. And let's say we wanted to have a slightly different appearance of it. We want to have a blonde color all we need to do is actually provide uh, an example input image uh, that he's going to use now. And uh, you provide an example image and it would immediately render this hair model um, using the same type of appearance. And it's not only just you know, for the heads, for the face and for the hair. The other thing that we're working on is on the human body, right? How can we digitize entire humans you know, directly? Why does it have to be something that's domain specific? So um, for the human body, um, it's a very, very important application because people think about it as using it for teleportation purposes, right? Can we have the hologram and then talk to each other like this uh, in the future? Um, the only solution right now that is commercially available um, that is you know, giving you decent results is something that is, um, for example, from Microsoft. Uh, this is their holoportation um, capture studio. So the idea here is you have hundreds of cameras active and passive sensing of a subject with 
con extremely controlled uh, lighting conditions, and you can capture the subject, right? So you have a post-processing that is happening on the cloud, and afterwards, you basically get your assets. But the idea is, how can we democratize uh, this type of technology and make it accessible to anyone, right? So one thing that we're working on is, well, if we have a lot of these data, can we actually train deep neural networks to imagine how the human body would look like? Well, it's really hard to collect all these data. So what we thought about is we just use computer graphics simulated humans that don't even look very nice, right? So these are just a bunch of random examples that we did. And we're just training a deep neural network and tell the deep neural network, this is how humans look like, right? And uh, what we did was uh, we took some of the data from um, MIT, which is just four um, videos, well, four viewpoints of, a, of the performance of a subject. And um, normally, you won't be able to use you know, techniques like multi-view stereo to reconstruct this person. The only thing you can do is something called visual hall, which in some ways is like a cookie cutter that is seen from different views. But what we can show here is that using deep neural networks that are trained using synthetic data, it can in some ways imagine how the shape of a human body looks like. So let me show you this in the next slide. So in the first row, you can see traditional techniques that all it does is given segmented regions of a person, it would basically cookie cut this person into um, the shape. So it's traditional technique. In the second row, it's the shape that the deep neural network imagine by just looking at four different views of this person, right? And everything um, you know, can be generated and it's temporally consistent as well. So the question now is what's next, right? So I really think that you know, this entire um, research in computer graphics is going in the direction of AI-driven graphics, right? So AI it's not uh, what we know as artificial general intelligence. It's really about pattern recognition. Um, I also think that um, th these type of content creation tools uh, will move towards something that is accessible to anyone. And also, you know, if we have all these immersive displays, right, um, augmented reality or virtual reality, um, there's going to be a trend into how content is going to be mixed with uh, reality, right? The digital and the real. And at some, in some ways, you can think of VFX as a form of augmented reality that is just not happening in real time. The, one of the last points here is the way you find content or retrieve content nowadays is you go to YouTube, you say, I want to watch a cute dog video, so you type in the words, and it will basically retrieve um, the relevant content to you and whatever is available. In the future, I think we're basically doing research, research toward a goal where a system can generate the content that you want, right? You can arbitrarily customize it. You can provide uh, reference examples. And um, this new form of YouTube is one that actually synthesizes content, right? And I believe that we're going to interact more and more with 3D avatars, and some of it is already happening through virtual avatars in the form of virtual influencers. So there's an interesting work from uh, the company Brud uh, with uh, Little Michaela that has you know, millions of followers. Um, so you know, the question in the end is all about how can we tell uh, you know, what is real, what is fake, and I think it goes beyond just you know, video manipulations, et cetera. But it's important to bring uh, awareness uh, into um, this domain. Thank you very much. No, wow. I feel like my life has changed, literally. Like oh, no. my, 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 my cinema experience would never be the same again. I'm going to be walking down the street also, just imagining all sorts of stuff. Um, we will now be taking questions from the audience. I'd love to welcome Sarah back to the stage. Um, we're also accepting questions via Twitter. So the hashtag is hashtag IETNGTalks. Um, so get tweeting if you're on Twitter. Um, we've got this um, catch box. And well, the idea is to speak into it when you have it here. So there's a cross on the top here. And if you bring it as close to your mouth as possible um, and speak into it. And we've got Sabira here to help. So if you've got a question, 
Um, you might have to stand up to catch or grab this, but yeah, just put your hand up and a spear would be thrown into you. Thank you. Right, great. Um, have we got any questions? Oh, yes, yes, yes there's a gentleman in the black shirt. That are <laughs> Excellent, yes. Hi. Hi, yeah. Um, it's a question both for both of you, really. But when, um, you know, if, you, if you're in a crowd and you see someone you know, quite often I think you recognise them more by the way they move and, you know, their gait and the way they move their arms and this sort of thing. Is, is any of your work sort of investigating that? Yeah, I think it's pretty much the next step, right? Um, right now, where whatever we create, uh, if someone is not familiar with that person, um, then you can, you know, I mean, if you're not familiar, you won't be able to tell, also from a single uh, frame uh, that this isn't real. Uh, but if someone is very familiar with that face, um, you know, you can tell that it's uh, not real. So the way to potentially solve this is that you would incorporate as prior a history of that person. So let's say if it was a celebrity um, or you know, a famous politician, uh, you can have enough sufficient footages to collect. Um, that, I mean, for deep fakes, that's one of the way it works. Um, you basically have uh, a large data set of images uh, or videos of the person, and it would try to mimic the things. But of course, um, you know, it's just not, just the images might not be enough. You probably need uh, other uh, things. Right. Sorry, have you got any thoughts? Um, no, no. I mean, the, the, the things I've been looking at is basically face swapping. So obviously that's the next step. And yeah, equally scary, I think, in terms of making that person far more real and believable. Yeah, it's worrying. <laughs> Great. Oh, we've got another question right next to you, uh, on your right. Uh, the lady behind you. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Thank okay. you. Do you think we need any legislation that will prevent people using this wrongly so where you see some fake images there's got to be some notifier on there yeah for sure um, actually um, we did a work uh, we, we co-organized a workshop um, with uh, a couple of I mean my colleagues actually uh, uh, co-organized a workshop uh, at SIGGRAPH this year so SIGGRAPH is the main event uh, in the field of computer graphics and the event was called uh, truth in images videos and graphics um, you actually probably Google for it. And we had a long debate uh, and a panel about, it was a super interesting session where we discussed about, you know, everything was online and we, we, we discussed about um, how do we handle uh, these kind of uh, issues. And uh, we had a long, you know, email thread uh, that followed up, uh, that, that followed from this um, workshop. And in some ways uh, we are basically discussing you know, at this point, and we have a lot of ideas about how do we um, create new guidelines and uh, rules and laws uh, based on like, <clears throat> you know, for both academics and industry and how um, we should go about uh, these kind of, um, the possibilities of these kind of technologies. So the first thing is, um, yes, we're creating awareness that this is possible. The second thing is really there has to be a couple of guidelines about what can you do and what you're not, um, what you should be discouraged to use this for, right? So you don't want to use this for porn. You don't want to use this to, you know, um, you know, create, uh, you know, start civil wars or, or any war, uh, which is which is all possible, right? I mean, um, we don't actually need technology to um, create fake news and to. Um, you know, spread uh, fake news, and you know th there are many examples where people actually died from it. Um, and uh, but you know, the, the fact that people actually believe in videos, um, you know, basically shows that people have to know that there's something wrong with it. So there's also there's definitely legislation there. Uh, the second thing is about technology. So it's about how do we, um, you know, how can we use digital forensics in order to detect that something was. Um, forged. Uh, I mean, fortunately, right now, it's still super easy to, to, um, to spot these things. But you can tell, right, if you put enough efforts and resources, if it's not just fully automated, you can actually achieve something that um, I think I would be fooled. Wow. Um, 
Yeah, um, yeah go back to yeah. The, yeah, the point about legislation, as we know, with new technology is, is moving at such a rapid rate and legislation takes a long time to, to catch up. So we only recently see laws around social media and fake accounts with that. So at the moment, those who've already been victim to deep fakes, those who featured in pornographic videos, there is no framework as yet to, um, you know, attack that, to, to address it. So, yeah, I think that's going to take some, some time to catch up, but clearly it does need to be very specific because this is a new phenomenon unlike any of those that we've seen before. And one thing that I think it's important uh, to this is that people have to work together, mm -hmm. right? So you have to work with politicians uh, in order to, you know, really understand what is actually happening. Um, yeah. Right, we've got, where's our catch box? There it is, all right, okay, we've got somewhere here, right in front, here. Hello. Right. Hi there. Um, so I know a little about neural networks, but I'm quite fuzzy on it, so if I'm terribly wrong about this, do forgive me. But the, you talked a bit about the adversarial networks, and I know when they first developed them, they're obviously a very useful training tool, but they also, when they first put them in, they were able to show a neural network that was generally quite good, a picture of a dog, and it would know absolutely that it was a panda because you hide in it certain details that fool them. Do you think as time goes on, we're gonna see people trying to fight back against this kind of thing by imprinting in their photos and videos stuff that makes it harder for them to process and impersonate? Yeah, that's, um, um, that's a good point, right? I mean, um, one of the, um, well, it's like an arms race, right? So you have one thing that improves and the other thing that will also get better. Um, but I mean, the early versions, you can just, you know, add, um, you know, some, some artifacts in it and it probably just won't work or, but um, I think things are getting more and more robust, right? And um, I think, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's uh, so much of an issue. All right, okay. The gentleman here in front with the red or pink tie. There's one more there. Yeah. <laughs> Hello there. Um, are, they, are they using a commercial word with what you're doing, like the police, where they're trying to say they've got a criminal and they want to build up an image of him? Can they use your technique to be a very accurate image and then maybe show a video for someone to recognise the person? Is, or is that a different world? Sorry, I didn't understand so, the question. So with the police, when they're trying to find a criminal, yeah. they may have a, a picture or something, of a, sc a scanty picture, mm -hmm. but could they use your enhancing techniques to produce something more accurate? Oh, yes. So the uh, yes. villain even, could be found by showing TV pictures, etc. For sure, for sure. And I think not only um, the research that I'm working on, um, there's also uh, work from other groups uh, in the world where they can turn sketches into a photorealistic output. Um, I think that's something that, you know, even if you just have a witness and someone trying to describe this, these are um, very, very uh, effective tools. Um, one other project uh, that I, I didn't show here that we're working on is how do you um, simulate facial hair onto someone, right? So some of the motiv motivation behind this is also for uh, crime cases or, you know, some for fashion. Uh, but the idea is really, given an image, how can I, you know, easily reproduce how a person would have a different type of beard, um, you know, stylized or non-stylized, to predict how they would look like, you know, if that person is missing after, you know. Mm, exactly, years. you could actually go in history, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, for sure. So these are very, very um, important applications, actually, actually, right? And I mean, there is, um, how do you create from, you know, stylized input to photorealistic conversions there is how do you up-res uh, low-quality CCTV images. There is even, um, actually there's even work, how do you convert IR night vision into colored images. So you have yeah, all these possibilities nowadays, um, as long as you have data. Yeah. And then the flip That's side good. to that is um, the state of visual evidence in court and you yeah. know, the status that we'll now have when there's a possibility to put someone at the scene of a crime who is never, never there and how they would deal with that in a court situation. Okay, right. thank you. We've got a question. Oh, that way. Are you happy to throw it in that direction? You ready? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> press the button. Press the button. Speak. You use the terminology breaking the algorithm in connection with strong light on hair. Uh, is that in any way different from uh, bad data causing a program to fail as, it's, uh, as has happened from uh, 
uh, day one computing. <laughs> oh, you're talking about the hair example? Yes, indeed. Yeah, um, when I said breaking the algorithm, uh, in that case um, refers more to, um, so a lot of the computer vision, I mean, this is like a typical computer vision problem. Um, before, I think, um, the rise of deep neural networks, um, there were many, many uh, scenarios where computer vision algorithms only worked in papers, in scientific papers on specific cases, but in practice it would fail because um, it was just unable to handle um, you know, new type of scenarios. So um, the main reason is um, when you talk to these scientists is that they would say, well, it's based on handcrafted descriptors, right? In some ways it's basically um, we try to develop a model and assume everything would fall into this model given an input image, but once it's not, um, here's an example, if I shine a very strong light onto my face, I have a strong contrast, then these algorithms would probably fail because they would, not, they would be unable to detect that it's a human. But using deep neural networks, uh, which is um, an approach that scales with data, it is capable of um, still handling these kind of uh, data. We need to test it with my with my hair. Yeah, we just yeah. tested it for yeah. for your hair. It actually <laughs> failed before. It, it did. But oh, right, if I okay. if I can take more pictures of you, yeah. then uh, right. we can improve our algorithms. <laughs> Great. Um, we've got some Twitter questions, so we'll kind of bring it back in this direction, and then we'll, we'll come to you, sir. Right. Way. Let's do this. Let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> nearly, nearly, very nearly. We need a question of <laughs> that's what we need to do next. We've got quite a few uh, Twitter questions now, so I don't know if you want to do a few in a row or do we want to break it up, but uh, I we will... Could, we could take two questions and then... Um, okay, yes. well, um, uh, Michael Wahon asks, does the compression technology uh, to get the face swapping software onto phones not impact on the performance in any way? Would the lack of computing power negatively affect the output at all? Sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> with, the lack of compute, with the lack of computing power on mobile phones uh -huh. negatively impact the output at all if you're using... Oh, yes, yes, for sure, for sure, yeah. But uh, we always, I mean, for a lot of the projects that we do, they're research, and uh, we're always thinking that, in some ways, we're also driving, you know, the hardware industry. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, we also have a uh, very specific funding uh, from uh, an agency uh, called DARPA and uh, SRC, and um, they are actually, uh, you know, they actually fund us to actually do research that requires a lot of uh, computing, right? And um, uh, they're excited about these possibilities because uh, what it means is that the entire computing architecture may also change in the future, right? So one of the research there is um, what if computing is um, so costly so that we need to um, have an architecture that's similar to the Wi-Fi system nowadays, so you would basically use edge compute to offload some of the computation mm -hmm. there, especially when in the future we're assuming that people will have more wearable um, technologies. Cool, thank you. Mind if I ask another question? Oh, sorry. Excuse me. I was just yeah. wondering, is this something you come across? Because technology against the work that you're actually doing, like, you know, matching strengths in a way. Yeah. 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 No comment on that question, but yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. same, 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 same things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Absolutely. second question. Uh, the next question by Claire Cheong. Um, with the eventual public use of deep learning to automatically generate video content and therefore make film making perhaps easier by more people, how will the film industry and the jobs of the industry be impacted? What will happen to Hollywood and the like? I, I imagine that goes for both of you. Yeah. Maybe you have a better answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I could go back to that, that example, you know, the Blair Witch Project, and, and there's those similar kind of um, questions raised then um, around film being given into the hands of independent filmmakers, having the opportunity because of the cheapness of technology coming down. So that at that time it was digital camcorders becoming available and the World Wide Web as a tool for marketing. And there's been very recent examples with iPhone films like Tangerine, for example. So I think it's um, actually quite exciting that it enables um, filmmakers who wouldn't normally have the opportunity to work within the Hollywood industry, a more you know, diverse range. Um, so I see that as a quite a promising potential, but I don't see it as perhaps, yeah, there's, there's a space for everything, I guess, in the filmmaking space, and no other technology yet has sort of 
derailed Hollywood on its, on its forward march. So I think what it does is diversify potential for yeah, different types of films, different stories to be told. Great. Yeah. yeah, there was this. Oh, were you going to say something? Um, sure. No. Um, so basically, I think um, on a philosophical level, um, I mean, I've been to a lot of different um, talks where people talk about, I mean, this is the exact analogy with like how AI is going to kill jobs and et cetera. But I think, um, and I think that's kind of nice that you went back in your talk, like uh, back in time. And I think there's also an analogy there because um, if you look at back in time when people, you know, invented the first automobile, um, you know, no one is going to ride on horses anymore. It's going to change. Or, you know, the, the, the first in industrial revolution, everything starts to get, you know, automated. And then um, the question is, is it going to, I think jobs are just going to change. And it's just transforming everything. And the same thing is probably also happening in the entertainment industry where things are just becoming more and more democratized. Um, I, I mean, even now, I think, um, one way to see it is that the entertainment industry, even without um, you know, artificial intelligence and all the progress in there, has also, also transformed, right? We would basically outsource everything to other countries uh, to you know, get the same results for cheaper. And um, the only thing that can actually uh, help us progress is to build more, um, is to advance technology, right? So if we don't stay ahead of time, then the economics uh, will actually um, just push everything out. Yeah. I guess, yeah, the dark side to answer that question also links back to the one about legislation is how in the future will performers license the right to their image and yeah. do they actually have to sign up to a film and go on, on set and act or do they just sign the rights to their image to be in that film and never leave their armchair but right. um, royalties <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Great. There's the gentleman on, on the end here. Oh. Do I need to press? I know if you just bring it to your mouth and speak okay. into it, um, yeah. Hi, thank you so much both for um, your, your talk today. It's very interesting. Uh, my question is very much related to the previous one about uh, Hollywood, but also about the dynamics of Hollywood and also uh, society, really. Imagine in Hollywood, um, in a conventional sense, a lot of uh, the actors or actresses, um, they're very physically appearing and they are very you know, pretty or, or handsome in other ways. Um, but imagine with your technology going forward, potentially someone with a, an ordinary look or ordinary um, um, build, they could be very good at acting and they could be pretend to be, or they can act to be anyone uh, in all these films. And in a society world where uh, in the future, poten potentially, um, people are not really physically be in conferences or meetings. You, you have physical appearance, so you don't really need to sort of go to gym to build up your actual physical strength. <laughs> but using the technology that you got, you could sort of uh, not fake the appearance, but you know pretend to be someone that you always dream to be. Um, how do you see the dynamic of that? Thank you. Um, it's already happening. <laughs> so you go to Instagram. I think every picture is filtered. If you, uh, there's a very big uh, Chinese app called Meitu. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it makes everyone with uh, bigger eyes, every picture is perfectly taken. Um, I think it's just gonna extrapolate that and make it uh, uh, crazier. But I think there's also another um, side of thing, which is, um, so this is something that uh, I had from a conversation with uh, our um, uh, business advisor at uh, Pinscreen where he had an interesting conversation with um, someone from the fashion industry. And they're saying that um, in some ways, um, you know, a couple, until a couple of years ago, people were always looking at, you know, you know, fashion models and say, this is like how I want to look like. But there is a trend nowadays in terms of also, you know, being democratized where you would follow, follow um, you know, Instagram uh, influencers, personalities that are, more ordinary in terms of uh, their appearance, uh, because it's some, in some ways it allows people to help connect uh, with each other. And one of the things that we're exploring, for example, is that what if it's actually you? And you can determine, you can customize the way you look like. Um, you know, if I you know eat a little bit more, I put on some weights, and then uh, yeah, I want to look like you know. <laughs> like an so, yeah. Instagram influencer. Right, 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 yeah. 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 Great. Have we got 
more questions? We've got time for it. There's a lady in... Oh, where are we now, sir? OK, we'll go that way and then come back to you. There's a lady in a black uh, jacket. Yeah. <laughs> way! Oh, wow. fantastic. <laughs> Hi, my question is more for the built environment sector because I work for engineering practice and architecture practice and now we're changing fundamentally the way we present. Uh, now we're building up models which is more in the VR or augmented reality or application specifically to buildings, developing algorithm, shaping the building and master planning. So what do you think it will be evolving in the future? Because now AI is coming into the game there is also the um, quantum computing, and there is a lot of competition already out there to change the industry. Are you, are you talking specifically for architecture and urban yeah. uh, design? <clears throat> well, I think the, I mean, I don't know, but I think um, the uh, way to think about this is what would make your job easier so that you can actually focus on what the machine cannot do. Um, so when I think about VFX, for example, right, uh, the effect, VFX industry, uh, the way it works is that you have a storyteller in the beginning, and then the storyteller would actually, you know, interact with a visual effects uh, supervisor, and he basically has a team of concept artists and a whole pipeline to generate the content, right? And um, if in an ideal world, uh, you would actually talk to an oracle, and that oracle would just, you would just tell them, hey, this is what I want. Well, actually, I don't know what I want, but I want to have something that can do this and this and this. And it would basically suggest things to you. So all you have to do, all your experience considers of, you know, it's like a shopping experience. It's like, hey, I want this. Wow, I've never seen this before. It's actually better than I could have done it myself, which is the ideal scenario if you have a great team of very strong people. So I think, you know, in terms of content um, creation, um, and I've seen work uh, in this area where, you know, in architecture, you know, not necessarily architecture, but in design, uh, people look at, you know, explorative design where it would generate things or allow you to have tools that can generate things so that you can explore how certain shapes would look like. Uh, but in the end, um, it would, I guess it would probably more um, converge towards something that is more creative rather than trying to solve something that could be optimized using uh, a computational solution. Um, in terms of AR and VR, well, I mean, AR and VR to me is a tool for simulation um, and collaboration. Simulation basically means that it's trying to give you an idea how something actually looks like. And collaboration, you know, it's basically the same as in automotive industry where people you make heavy use of, you know, VR and AR to actually present their designs and, you know, engineering challenges so that they can actually talk more effectively because everything is 3D. Okay. That's very correct, yeah. Um, and that excites me being in the built environment space, actually, it really does, yeah. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it does. Um, more questions this way? Yes, please. Oh, there's one right in front of you, and then we'll come this way. It's coming soon. Hi, I, just as it's already gone to built environment, I can see how you could maybe use this for safety in mostly automotive. There's been two recent um, incidents on the news about people being dragged along by trains and we rely on cameras and the cameras sometimes can sort of be used to figure out people are people and then do things in, uh, I think it's already used in airports. Um, in automotive, one of the key things is you want to slam the brakes on before you hit someone. Mm -hmm. But what if it's just a bag floating in the wind? Right. And then if you slam on the brakes and you've got old people in the car, you can kill them from the force without right. even having a crash. Um, do you think this technology with its larger database could be used? And key to this, how fast can it help you detect someone? So if you've got less than a second, can you improve that detection? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point, right? Um, I think uh, if anything is sensed and computerized, I can probably it has the potential to make decision faster than humans. Um, I mean, just in like you know 
high frequency trading. I mean, everything is much faster than what humans could do. Um, and um, any, um, you know, uh, the potential of deep neural networks for computer vision problems, um, it's, uh, it's uh, very likely to solve many of them, right? So one, but one thing that has to be, uh, uh, people have to be very careful about, and I think that's something that um, people who, you know, work with startups or even like research labs have to be very careful is that they do have the potential to be superior than humans in certain tasks, but things have to be tested properly, right? So uh, one example is, for example, in they're super big right now for healthcare, right? So for detecting tumors, they're better than, like statistically, they're better than humans. But then you can always have an edge case where for some reason they just detected the wrong thing. And I think that's something that uh, we need to look into and probably build in some fail-safe safe mechanism uh, in case uh, they still go wrong, right? Made me think about the, the ethical debates in driverless cars that are going on at the moment where a car is in a no-win situation and it has to decide which vehicle it's going to crash into or who it might hit or maim or kill. Um, and those sort of how you then program AI in an ethical manner to to make those decisions and thinking about facial detection, it goes another step further, doesn't it? Actually recognising who's driving the different cars or who's on the pavement. Are they a criminal or some upstanding member of society? <laughs> so again, I always go to the darker side, but yeah, <laughs> makes, makes the mind boggle really what, what could happen. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, can we have in this? Oh, there's one person oh, there. Sure. Okay. Yep. My question is that, or observation, there's a lot of content in storylines that progress characters or sets of characters over a period of time. Now, you can either simulate that with uh, multiple actors or very heavy makeup, and you've also got to create perhaps the backdrop of, say, going from the 50s up to almost present times. Is there the prospect of simulating aging in a realistic way and also filling in the backdrops? So, um, simulating aging, um, but then, and then what? So, so you, well, let, let's just suppose that uh, um, one followed a character from the age of about 20 yeah. when they were no, highly active, mm -hmm. and you follow them through to the time of their middle age and older age. Mm -hmm. But there was also various other characters or family actors around them. Because there's many, many novels that have that scenario, mm -hmm. and uh, that might open up a lot more content for film and video. Right, right. Yeah, these things are uh, technically possible, right? Um, and I mean, you have the conventional way and also the um, uh, you know, high-end way of you know, simulated, simulating aging or de-aging. I think the conventional way, it's best seen in the movie The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have, uh, it's actually one of the best uh, CG faces, mm. um, but also in that movie, um, they employed a lot of uh, tricks to make it uh, easier, right? So it's like darker scenes, but it, I mean, they did an amazing job actually in, um, you know, creating a, you know, simulated older and younger version of Brad Pitt. And if I remember correctly, uh, they were saying that de-aging is actually much harder uh, because, um, I mean, first of all, we've seen how Brad Pitt looks like when he was young and not when he gets old. And um, also, whenever you, and that's also true for um, human, like um, faces that have, you know, less detailed in the skins, uh, especially for female characters who have really, really nice skins without all these pores, um, it's usually harder to get everything right. Great. So we've got time for one question. This is it. We're going to have to do some hopping. Oh, oh, Ooh. oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, you talked about democratizing the software quite a lot. To what level would you democratize it? So would it just be to sort of like um, other industries or would it be down to the individual that could just download an app on their phone? And in what ways would it be? Would it just be a cost thing or also, you know, having the skills and expertise as how to use the software effectively? Yeah, um, usually it happens in stages. 
But I think uh, when we're talking about democratizing here, it's really not, uh, it's really for end, end users. So basically people who are not even experts, um, who could actually achieve what is only possible with act, you know, experts nowadays, or even entire teams of experts. So um, for example, one of the last slides I was showing with this YouTube example, just imagine you watch, you're watching TV and the TV is not like a choice between different uh, channels, but it's basically generating something that is completely unique that only you will see, uh, something that you like, something that, uh, I mean, this is science fiction, right? But uh, in some ways, uh, to a certain extent, this is uh, possible, right? It's, it's not like something that um, uh, may, come, may potentially come sooner than later. And uh, I can tell you that uh, not just us, but a large amount of researchers are actually walking, working towards this type of goal, right? And it can be people who are in you know, the VR industry, it could be people who are in um, the social media industry, like um, you know, we have companies like Snapchat who have like highly sophisticated you know, research teams that are working on um, these type of problems, right? Great. Um, I think that's it. I would like to say a massive thank you to Sarah and Hal for amazing talks, um, truly fascinating, inspiring as well, um, controversial as well, but definitely our reality in 2018. Um, so thank you very, very much to them. Uh, a round of applause again. <laughs> And I'd also like to say a big thank you to all of you, uh, our, their audience tonight. Um, it's been great to have you here. Um, it's always a pleasure to, 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 to see you here. Um, please join us for drinks in the uh, reception registration rooms. Uh, we have got a couple of other talks later on this year. Um, there is um, the President's Address on the 11th of October. Please join us. Um, our next end talk is on the 21st of November with Nick Rogers of Jaguar Land Rover. It promises to be as exciting and as informative as today's has been. Um, what you need to do if you're interested is uh, look for um, people with ENG talk t-shirts, blue t-shirts as you come out and they will scan your badges and get you all uh, on the list for those talks. Uh, yeah, and that's me. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.